soy la responsable del área de investigación histórica del Archivo General de la Universidad de la República. Nosotros invitamos a la doctora Tarton a venir a visitarnos. Estamos más que contentos y honrados con la profesora Lorraine Daston que nos ha hecho el, el honor realmente de venir hasta, hasta el sur, es su primera vez en Sudamérica y su primera vez es en Montevideo así que eso también nos pone muy contentos Thank you so much Thank you for that generous introduction My thanks to my host especially to Vanya Makarian for the invitation to Isabel for the absolutely perfect introduction to this theme, and to all of you for coming this evening. Um, let me begin with the natural history theme. Okay, this is an elephant. If you are trying to teach a child, say a child of three or four years old, what an elephant is, you only have to show the child perhaps three or four pictures like this, and the child has it for life. It doesn't matter if the next picture of an elephant the child sees is a drawing like this one, or whether it's in all the colors of the rainbow like this one, um, or even if it's wearing clothes. The child knows that this is an elephant. Um, the child is never going to confuse an elephant with a goldfish, with a dog, even with a rhinoceros, much less with a house or an ice cream cone. Cognitive scientists don't really know how human children form concepts so quickly. After all, they only get a few examples and then they can generalize to all other, even very strange examples of elephants. This can be done, it has been done, but it's done in a very different way than we teach the child. Instead of showing the child three or four examples, you have to feed the supercomputer tens of thousands of examples. Um, and through machine learning, eventually, the computer corrects its own algorithms and eventually understands what um, an elephant is, albeit with often with many mistakes. It's now the case with the algorithms of machine learning that a supercomputer like this one can imitate the cognitive achievements of a human child, but one thing we know for certain, it doesn't do so by the same processes by which the child learns. And we know this because <laughs> The child probably, in many cases, only has to see one image in order to get the category of elephant, whereas artificial intelligence, or AI, is based in some ways on the oldest and most basic of all algorithms, that is, the operations of arithmetic. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, all over the world, in cultures from ancient Mesopotamia to ancient China, medieval India, medieval Europe, um, learning to calculate with the basic algorithms of arithmetic is one of the three techniques of scribal cultures, the other being reading and writing. And here we see um, the allegory of geometria teaching um, students sometime around the, in the 14th century. Um, in the context of big calculation, that supercomputer that I showed you a moment ago, in which thousands of numbers um, were crunched by human computers before the invention of mechanical calculating machines, especially in the context of astronomical observations, but also in the offices of tax collectors or in banks. In those days, calculation was 
classed as a form of intellectual hard labor, of intellectual drudgery. Um, the astronomer Johannes Kepler, um, who is trying to figure out the orbit of the planet Mars around 1604, complained bitterly about all the calculations that he had to do by hand. This is a folio from um, Kepler's notebook. Um, for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, we have the complaints of astronomers and mathematicians about how tedious it was to have to do all of these calculations by hand. And perhaps some of you are as old as I am and can remember before the age of pocket calculators doing some of these by, by hand. Um, from Blaise Pascal, whose calculating machine we just saw an image of, this is, um, Pascal's machine arithmétique from 1645, from this first attempt at a calculating machine to the designs for Charles Babbage's analytical engine around 1840, and thereafter, calculating machines have promised one thing, and that is, to quote Pascal, to relieve you of the labor that has so often fatigued your minds. It's therefore really surprising that artificial intelligence, nowadays our best candidate for a form of intelligence which may equal or even surpass human intelligence, should turn out to be all about calculations, as we just saw in the film that Isabel showed us. Um, more specifically, there's an element perhaps of algorithmic intelligence in big calculation that offers us a clue as to how a form of intelligence that for centuries has been in considered to be the very opposite of intelligence, it's seen to be the lowest form of mental activity, um, and at worst seen as mechanical, became the very prototype of a very powerful intelligence. And here you see the first time that a computer bit, um, beat a chess grandmaster, this is IBM's Deep Blue, defeating Boris Kasparov. And you see Boris Kasparov was really very unhappy about this in May of 1997. So in this lecture, what I'd like to do is to look at the history of big calculation as a chapter in the history of intelligence. And here I mean the intelligence of both humans and machines. I'll argue that the algorithms of calculation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, are only part of the story. The other part of algorithmic intelligence is how to divide a complex task into a sequence of the simplest, smallest component parts. This is what we now call the division of labor. As we'll see, the history of algorithmic intelligence as practiced by both humans and machines belongs as much to the history of work as it does to the history of mathematics. So we now shift the scene. It's Paris, 1791. The French Revolution, which broke out in 1789, has just introduced the metric system. The metric system is to the French Revolutionary government what the moon landing was to the American government in the 1960s. This is its big scientific prestige project. Um, the French Assemblée Nationale said this is going to be a system of weights and measurements which will be based on nature's own standards. Now, nature's own standards is perhaps a, um, an exaggeration. It's base 10, which means our 10 fingers or our 10 toes. Um, and it's going to be the uniquely rational solution to the miscellany of weights and measures that bedeviled commercial exchange even within France, much less with other countries. So, as I say, from its origins, this project was a French prestige project, and all over Paris, 
there were mounted in the walls um, meter sticks like this one. This is the last one that survives from the French Revolution. Next time you're in Paris, look at the Rue Vaugirard by across from the Jardin de Luxembourg. This is the last one um, that survives. It's supposed to show um, the superiority of the French metric system all, all over all other systems of weights and measures. And just as with the moonshot in the United States, is supposed to show the superiority of the French revolutionary government over all other kinds of government. Um, in order to make sure that this project attracted the attention of mathematicians and scientists all over the world, the French government commissioned an engineer, Gaspard Riche de Prony, to recalculate um, over 100,000 logarithms to at least 14 decimal places in the new base 10 system. This was going to have to be done all by hand. So how was Prony going to do this? Remember, this is 1791. Things are starting to look very bad for scientists who are not cooperating with the French Revolution. A few years later, Lavoisier is going to be guillotined. So Prony has to solve this problem. He's inspired by his reading of the Scottish political economist Adam Smith, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. And Prony remembers the first famous chapter of the Wealth of Nations in which Adam Smith dis shows how pins can be manufactured more efficiently through a division of labor in which each worker is given only one task to perform and does that task over and over again. So this is how pins are produced in the 18th century. And you see um, here someone is drawing out a, a metal thread. And here someone is cutting it to just the right length. Pony said, I'm going to manufacture logarithms the way pins are manufactured through a division of labor. And what he did was to create a kind of pyramid of mathematical workers. At the very top, there were four or five very great mathematicians who developed the formulas for converting regular logarithms into base 10 logarithms. The next is the calculators. These are about seven or eight people whom Prony called algebraicists. They're trained in analysis. And what they do is to take the abstract formulas of the great mathematicians and to translate them into numerical calculations that are then performed by the third, which is about 60 to 70 workers, ouvriers. Those are people who know nothing about mathematics. All they can do, they can't even multiply and divide. All they can do is add and subtract. But the labor has been divided so that they can do millions and millions of calculations in order to complete this mammoth project in only four years. So here is the manuscript of the, the Fairhand manuscript of the Observatoire de Paris of these calculations. I mean, the tragedy is that the French Revolution, as you know, fell on hard times, and this was never published. So the, it's still the case that the only calculations, the, the only um, result of these calculations is still in manuscript form um, at the Observatoire. Um, but Prony actually finished this task. Um, Prony's project attracted a great deal of attention, just as the French Revolution had hoped, and it especially impressed the British mathematician and political economist Charles Babbage, who suggested that the workers, the workers here at the base of the pyramid, of Prony's pyramid, could be replaced by machinery. And it would only be necessary to employ people to copy down as fast as they were able the figures that were presented to them by the engine. Um, here is the engine that Babbage 
So this is actually not the engine that Babbage actually um, developed. It's a modern reconstruction from his plans. Um, the story some of you will know of Babbage's plans for the first computers um, swallowed up his fortune, he was a banker, and also 35,000 pounds, an enormous fortune at the time, of money from the British government, but he could never really get it to work. Um, one thing that's important to keep in mind about the history of calculating machines is that although we have them since the mid-17th century, they don't work. Um, and the reason they don't work is that, you see those wheels, all those wheels there? They stick. So that when you're carrying from the tens column to the hundreds column to the thousands column, it unfortunately um, often gets stuck. And for that reason, you always had to check the results by hand, which sort of defeated the purpose of it all. But nonetheless, this idea that Babbage had, that if you could get workers who were so, as it were, mindless, that their work was mechanical, you could replace them by machines. Now remember that Pronis project that produced the hundreds of thousands of logarithms to 14 decimal places, this was done with no machines more complicated than paper and, and a quill pen. There were no machines whatsoever. It's Babbage who has the idea, if very stupid people can do this, then machines can do this. And that is the origin of the modern computer. Now, this is a very familiar story, and it's usually told from Babbage's perspective. So in his eyes, the great achievement was to figure out how to make calculations mechanical without machines. Um, and therefore, it was, or so Babbage thought, a short step to go from the merely mechanical workers at the base of Pony's pyramid to real machines. So for Babbage, and for everybody else who's, who's followed Babbage in this, the critical step in this are the workers. But in fact, I think that the critical step is the middle tier. These are the people, these seven to eight algebraicists, who had the task of dividing the very complicated calculations into the smallest, easiest possible steps so that the workers at the bottom could do those thousands and thousands of additions and subtractions. In other words, they created, the people in the middle, created the algorithms that meshed machines with mechanical labor by humans and ultimately with machines. So from the mid 19th century to at least the mid 20th centuries, it's this kind of what we might call managerial intelligence that came to dominate the factories of big calculation, insurance companies, astronomical observatories, railways, government statistical offices, like the one that conducted the census, for example, um, naval almanacs, accounting offices, and also later military weapons research. By the way, notice, all the people you see in this image are women. In the film that Isabel showed us, I saw only one woman. In fact, almost all of the calculation that's being done with actual machines is going to turn out to be done by women. And I'll say more about this um, in a moment. So this is the beginning of the world we live in now. We are constantly, whenever we're online, we, the humans, are constantly interacting with the machines, with algorithmic intelligence. And the story I want to tell is this strange hybrid form of intelligence in which humans and machines have to work together. Algorithmic intelligence has both a narrow and a broad sense. The narrow sense are the algorithms of arithmetic, those calculations, are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But the broader sense of algorithmic intelligence is to breaking down a very complicated test, whether it is booking a flight online um, or um, trying to create a railway time schedule 
or to tabulate the results of the census, a complicated task like that, um, into an ordered flow of simple tasks. And I don't know how many of you have ever tried to assemble a couch or a bookshelf from instructions. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be about calculation. It's the idea of um, dividing a task into steps so simple that even I can put together a bookshelf. That's the second kind of algorithmic intelligence. So long after Prony, long after Babbage, and even after the spread of reliable calculating machines in the late 19th century, humans are still playing, humans like these humans, are still playing a crucial role in big calculation. So when did, so this is the Thomas arithmometer. The Thomas arithmometer is invented in the 1820s, but it's only mass manufactured um, in the, after 1870. It's the first calculating machine that operates more or less reliably. Um, by about 1900, banks all over the world have machines like this one. Um, insurance offices, government offices, um, and, and, but not, not yet scientific laboratories and astronomical observatories. And the reason is that these machines perform much better than any of the previous machines did, but they're still not terribly reliable. So one of the big users of the Thomas Arithmometers, the Prudential Insurance Company in London, had a workshop devoted entirely to repairing the machines that broke down, um, which broke down quite regularly. What, what mechanization did do, the introduction of real machines to do calculation, was to change the organization of big calculation. And we're now going to fast forward to the moment where machines like this one are being, going to be introduced into scientific calculation. So this is a center of big calculation around 1920. This is the office of the British Nautical Almanac. Since 1767, the British Nautical Almanac has been producing astronomical tables for sailors at sea throughout the British Empire. It has to be produced every year because, of course, the astronomical values will change every year. So first of all, look at the personnel. It's mostly, it's sort of men of various ages. Notice what they have on their desks. They have pencil, paper, compass, and over here you see these big books. Those are tables in which they're looking up values, probably logarithm, logarithm tables. Um, they are going to, they're calculating the ephemerides that are going to guide um, navigators throughout the British Empire. Originally, because this depended so much on astronomical observations, originally the um, nautical almanac was, um, sorry, was based at the um, Royal Greenwich Observatory. So you have to imagine um, this room with a big table in the middle with lots of paper, pens, and all around the table on high stools are schoolboys of about 15 or 16 years old who are doing the calculations. What happens when machines like the Thomas Arithmometer um, are introduced is that the labor of doing those calculations has to be entirely reorganized. Um, this presents a triple challenge to the supervisors of centers of big calculation. First, and most obviously, the machines, like this one, the Seguin calculating machine, rarely calculated in the same way that we humans do mental arithmetic. So we do multiplication by iterated addition. Um, if you have forgotten you know, what four times seven is, you can add up seven four times and you can get the right number. 
This machine doesn't do it at all that way. It does it by changing the numbers that are to be multiplied or divided or added or subtracted into polynomials um, of factors of, of 10. So, so that's the first problem. Um, these machines are difficult to integrate into a human workflow because they are thinking in an entirely different way than the human calculators. Um, second, the meshing of machines like this one with the human operators of the machines um, required many new of procedural algorithms that divides a problem like computing the positions of the moon um, into a finite sequence of well-defined instructions. We now call this, when we're talking about computers, the program, but at the time it was simply like an instruction book. Um, not unlike the instruction book for assembling that bookshelf that I showed you. And third, the interactions of the humans and the calculating machines demanded new efforts of Herculean attention on the part of the human operators who, far from being liberated from the tedium of big calculation, remember Pascal's promise that the calculating machine would relieve the human intellect. Far from relieving the human intellect, it placed greater burdens than ever before. So I'm going to start with the first and second parts of the transition, and then I'll come back to the problem of um, human intelligence. So it must have been um, a really um, difficult transition to go from the silence of the octagon room at the Royal Observatory where all you heard was the scratching of pens and the turning of the pages of the logarithm tables um, to, so remember, to a room filled with adding machines like this one. Um, so that one goes from the office looking like this, where you could have heard a pin drop, to looking something like this. Um, with those Burroughs calculating machines. Um, when the first Burroughs calculating machines, machines like this one, were introduced into the office of the Nautical Almanac around 1930, um, it was almost unbearable. And the superintendent of the Nautical Almanac, Leslie Comrie, described the scene. We have a large Burroughs adding machine in continual use, which is so noisy that no degree of concentration is possible in the room where it is working. It is essential for the sake of the other workers that the machine have a room all by itself. Now, why was the office so crowded? Um, because the use of the machines dictated that work that had previously been farmed out to outside workers, so these might have been um, retired calculators or teachers or clergymen or their relatives who were looking to pad their modest incomes. Instead, now all the calculations have to be done in the office. They have to be done in the office. Um, especially since these expensive machines were, could not leave the office. Um, moreover, these workers, unlike the other workers who worked at home, required close supervision. Um, they were cheaper workers. Who were they? They were no longer boys, fresh from the school, as in the days of the octagon room at Greenwich Observatory, but there are a half a dozen unmarried women, British civil service regulations prohibited the hiring of married women, who have passed a competitive examination in mathematics, English, and general knowledge. So we have now, this is not actually the Nautical Almanac office, but it probably looks something like this, um, um, in which we have continual clacking of machines um, all day long. Paradoxically, the machines introduced with the intention of cutting costs and saving labor and speeding up production. The, the Nautical Almanac, when these machines are introduced, the Nautical Almanac is almost 12 months behind its publication schedule. This is disastrous because 
it might as well not be published if it's 12 months out of date. Um, and there, this is long before GPS. Um, there's no other way, aside from the compass, for the, the sailors in the British Navy or the merchant marine to find their way around the globe without these, these tables. So it's urgent that this be produced on time. The initial effect of starting to use machines like the Burroughs adding machine was to hire more workers, spend more money, disrupt production, and increase mental effort, especially for the supervisors who were charged with reorganizing how calculations were done in order to integrate human and mechanical calculators into a smooth, efficient, and error-free sequence. So, you just saw in the film that Isabel showed us um, very briefly the Hollerith machine. The Hollerith machine was invented in the 1880s to handle the American census, and then its, its use spread to many, many other kinds of, of enterprises. Here is um, the British Milk Marketing Board. Once again, notice that the personnel is entirely female. Um, in order to do the lunar ephemeris, the superintendent of the nautical almanac wants to rent one of these machines for six months. Um, this is going to cost 264 pounds sterling for the machine itself. Then there's going to be an additional expense of 10,000 punch cards, which will cost 100 pounds, plus the wages of six young women um, for 12 months to punch in the numbers and operate the machine, that's 234 pounds. And did I mention the extra nine pounds for the electricity bill? So, whereas previously, what you would have done if you wanted this calculation done would be to write to one William A. Doken, MA in mathematics from Cambridge, and say, do the lunar ephemeris. And four or five months later, it would come ready for the printers and cost 500 pounds. Now, it's going to cost 607 pounds, and it's going to take months and months to train the calculators to use the new machines. Um, one must have anticipated a few raised eyebrows when the superintendent presented this plan to his bosses at the penny-pinching British Admiralty. But that wasn't the only problem. A true calculating machine, runs one definition from circa 1930, is one that suppresses in its operation all that could genuinely demand a mental effort. But like Freud's return of the repressed, mental effort and fatigue tended to return through the back door. Quite apart from the fatigue endured by the women who were going to be punching um, those cards, there was the effort of rethinking the division of labor of the millions of calculations that were involved in producing something like the nautical almanac. Um, so we have new, new calculators being introduced and tried out. Um, the problem for the supervisor is that whereas previously he could give to his employees um, an instruction, a task which they could complete holistically, he now had to break it down into perhaps um, 120 pages worth of instructions for the calculators. And the superintendent wrote to the admirals, admiralty saying, 20 to 30% of my entire time is now taken up by dividing the task into enough steps so that it can be done by the new laborers, the new cheap laborers, um, by machine. This is the analytical intelligence of algorithmic intelligence concentrated to an essence. It involves, of course, many, many calculations, but also the division of labor, which has been rethought to accommodate machines and the allegedly mechanical workers who operated them, all in the name of cost cutting. If there was pressure on scientific calculation, like the nautical almanac, to cut costs, there was even more pressure on business enterprises, 
like the railways. Um, the largest of the French railways, um, the um, Chemin de Fer Paris Lyon Méditerranée, which was this is a poster, one of, their, one of their many beautiful posters, um, was also at the very same time that the Nautical Almanac was introducing machines, was also introducing hollow earth machines. Um, and um, the supervisor, Georges Boyle, who was the head of accounting, graduate of École Polytechnique, explained that the economic advantages of these new machines were really incalculable, but only if every single detail of the workflow had been meticulously thought out in advance. From the women who are going to be punching the cards to devising icons for the kind of freight. So the idea is that the women who are punching the cards don't even have to look at the text. They see up here, vache, boeuf, pork, and they see the little image which speeds up their identification and coding of the data. As in the case of the Nautical Almanac, the use of machines entailed centralizing the workplace, in this case it was Paris, of course, and hiring the cheapest labor that was consistent with the qualifications of care, concentration, and much orderliness, women, of course. The economic advantage of a cheap workforce were apparently so great that Boyle thought that all the difficulties involved in abandoning the old methods, not the least the costs of the machines themselves, would be pale by comparison. However different in their design, materials, power, and reliability, all calculating machines from the 17th century to the mid 20th century promised to relieve human intelligence, not to replace it. The inference that was drawn from the ability of machines to calculate was not that machines were intelligent, but that a calculation was not an intelligent activity. So in contrast to our views about artificial intelligence, which is all about calculation, the view until about 1970 was, if a machine can do calculation, then it's not a high level intellectual activity. But it's a very peculiar sort of mindlessness that calculation involves especially using these calculating machines. It involves the utmost attention and memory. Um, this was displayed in a wave of psychological studies devoted to calculating prodigies on the one hand and to the operators of the calculating machine on the other. Now, these two groups might have once been seen as opposite ends of a spectrum. On the one extreme, you have the, the calculating prodigies, the virtuosi of calculation, who can do hundreds of sums in their heads. And on the other, you have um, the badly paid women operators who use the calculating machines. But the way in which mechanical calculation devalued calculation brought these two groups together in very strange ways. So in the history of mathematics, the history of 18th and early 19th century mathematics, um, there are several great mathematicians who were also calculating prodigies. So Karl Friedrich Gauss, the great German mathematician, um, astonished his parents and his teachers at the age of three by being able to do hundreds of sums in his head. Um, the French mathematician André Marie Ampère was also a, a calculating prodigy. Um, but by around 1900, the time at which calculating machines came into wide usage, um, there were no longer any stories being told about mathematicians being really, really good at arithmetic. On the contrary, if you ask a mathematician today whether he or she is good at arithmetic, they say, oh, no, I'm terrible, terrible at it. So it has become a sign of not having any mathematical talent to be able to be very good at mental arithmetic.
And you can see this change happening around 1900. Um, the professor of experimental psychology at the Sorbonne, Alfred Binet, which some of you may know in connection with the Stanford Binet intelligence test, was charged by the Paris Academy des Sciences to investigate two calculating prodigies who are making the rounds of French theaters. So here's one of them. This is the Italian um, calculating prodigy, Jacques Inaudi. Uh, Jacques Inaudi would appear regularly on the Paris stage um, and do um, remarkable sums in his head. Binet subjected Inaudi to six months of t all kinds of psychological tests. And at the end, he concludes um, that the talents of someone like Inaudi, Inaudi came from um, a very poor family in um, the northern part of Italy. He was a shepherd. Um, he started to display his calculating abilities even before he knew how to write down numbers. So it was a completely mental activity. Uh, he was otherwise illiterate. So he was really quite a remarkable case. So, this is someone who showed his talent at a very early age. But according to Binet, these calculating prodigies remain children all their lives. And aside from their extraordinary abilities in mental arithmetic, they were completely unremarkable, even substandard in, in intelligence. What was truly prodigious, according to Binet, about the calculating prodigies was really their powers of memory, and above all, their force of attention, especially as applied to numbers. And it's exactly this focused attention, which is at once monotonous and monothematic, it only applies to numbers, that the operators of calculating machines were expected to sustain for hours on end. The unbearable strain of attention required of human calculators had long been a bone of contention between them and their employers. And what's very interesting is that even in the centers of big calculation, the astronomical observatories, the nautical almanac, the railway offices, even when the supervisors are obsessed with efficiency and cutting costs, they nonetheless often reduce the hours of their calculators, sometimes to only five hours a day because they're so worried about the errors that might creep in because of the extraordinary strain of doing the calculations with the machines. So, to give you an idea, this is, this is actually a very simple arrangement, but to do the kinds of calculations that were required by either the French railways or by the, the nautical almanac, you often had 16 different steps starting from when the operator put the paper in one machine, sort of a typewriter-like machine, to the point where she cleared the tally and began the next calculation. Um, in a study devoted to the operation of the French railway uh, women computers in 1931, um, the psychologist who did the study noticed that the gestures of putting the paper in, punching in the numbers, clearing the tally, those could be, in a sense, automated. Those could, could become unconscious in the way that factory work can become unconscious. What could never become unconscious was the attention to the numbers themselves. Because the moment you let your attention wander, there's a risk of error. And if you punch in the wrong numbers, it doesn't matter how skilled you are. Um, they discovered that there were enormous, this is the, these are the results of the best 10 human computers, the human calculators at the French Railway, no, there were enormous variations in attention, memory, and force, which is why even the efficiency obsessed French Railway so that these women could only work for six hours a day and, there, and only for 14 consecutive days. So instead of alleviating intel, um, in the mental effort, these machines had ended up exacerbating it. This was particularly disturbing for late 19th, early 20th century psychologists, people like William James or Binet or Wilhelm Wundt, because they thought that the 
most conscious act of the intellect was the will to concentrate your attention on a really tedious task. And it was extremely disturbing to them to see that the people who had been charged with what was supposed to be the most mindless of all tasks were in fact the people who showed the greatest ability to concentrate their attention on a mindless task. So I come to my conclusion. In the first era of mechanical calculation, which was roughly from about 1860 to about 1970, this was an age not just of machines, but of humans and machines meshed together. This changed the meaning of calculation. For centuries, algorithms in the original sense of the word, that is, the basic operations of arithmetic, had been a synonym for intellectual transparency. This is the intuition that makes sense of a project that Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz had in the 1660s. He had this idea that you could resolve arguments if you coded all concepts in numbers and then calculated. This is one of Leibniz's brilliant, wacky ideas. But the intuition behind this idea was that Arithmetic, even though it might be simple, is transparent to the understanding. We understand it. This is also the intuition in a very different kind of project, a political project. This is a book of um, a textbook, one of the first textbooks written for the École um, Centrale, which are the French revolutionary schools by the mathematician, the Marquis de Condorcet. And Condorcet thinks if you can train young French children in the operations of arithmetic, three plus four equals seven, five plus eight equals 13, if they have that clear and distinct idea, they will not be misled by lying politicians and priests. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. <laughs> it didn't seem to work, but it was a wonderful idea. Um, um, so, so for, for really millennia, arithmetic was held up as the mental operation, however simple, that was transparent to our understanding and was, in a sense, the rock bottom of mathematical self-evidence. The impact of big calculation executed by sequences of humans and machines was to cloud over the transparency of the algorithms of arithmetic to human intelligence. So remember how I began, which was that the machine learning, which eventually will teach a computer how to recognize an elephant, we have no idea how it does this. Um, it is utterly opaque to us. Already with the integration of human calculators with mechanical calculators, this opacity has begun to set in. It's partly because a task that was once conceived of holistically, um, compute the lunar ephemeris, was now going to be analyzed, whoops, excuse me, into steps that were conceptualized in terms of the very different capacities of humans and machines. Division of labor was nothing new in big calculation. Long before even Brony's project, astronomical observatories had figured out how to divide very long calculations in, into steps. What was new was the fact that the machines did not operate by the same rules as humans operated in terms of how they did their calculations. Um, that meant that you had to figure out where the competence of the humans lay, which turned out to be this very focused, monotonous attention, and where the competences of the machines lay, which turned out to be very rapid calculation. That's why the superintendents of the French Railway or the British Nautical Almanac had to think in terms of completely rethink the steps of complicated calculations, which after all had been performed for centuries already by teams of entirely human calculators 
organized according to a division of labor, but a very different one. The overall effect of these changes was to make calculation more efficient, eventually, but also more opaque, at least to human intelligence. Even stranger was the change wrought by the interaction of human and mechanical calculators to the mindful direction of voluntary attention. The operators, who continued to be women right through the 1970s, here they are at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory calculating um, probably the trajectory of that rocket that went to the moon. Um, the operators may no longer have performed the actual calculations, but the vigilant attention demanded by their task was every bit as tedious and wearisome as the mental labor that had motivated the invention of calculating machines in the first place. Mental fatigue among these operators was evidently so great that their working hours were shortened in defiance of the iron rule of economy that had justified the purchase of the calculating machines. Calculating machines, even reliable ones, did not banish mindfulness and monotony from big calculations. They simply displaced these mental exertions to other tasks and people. Yet in so doing, they created an entirely new form of human intelligence. It was at once intensely mindful in its concentration of attention, but also blankly mindless in the Wittgensteinian sense of being opaque to the understanding. This oxymoronic state, intense concentration but without understanding, has become all too familiar to anyone who has ever filled out a form online. This is the way we think now. Thank you very much for your attention.